right from the very moment of fertilization. And I wanted to say that that meant that the moral significance of the ending of that life increases as you go through that nine months. So I wanted to say that there are cases where abortion can be justified. I don't need to say that every abortion can be justified. I don't believe that. I just need to say there can be one abortion that's justified to actually refute my opponent who says all abortions are wrong. Wrong in that special sort of way that makes them absolutely wrong can never be overridden by other considerations. The hardest case for her, of course, is when the fetus would, if it developed, kill the mother. Stephanie tries to avoid that by making the distinction between killing and letting die. So she says the aim there is not to abort the fetus and save the life of the mother. The aim is to save the life of the mother, and it just so happens that it kills the fetus. I think that's a dodge. I don't think it actually carries any weight at all. And indeed, you could, you could put it back on her uh, in lots of cases, you can say, oh, well, this woman who wants to get rid of the fetus, she doesn't, what she really wants is to have her life back the way it was. She said, the side effect is that the fetus has to be destroyed, but that's not her intention. Her intention is to get her life back the way it was before. I don't think that's a very good argument either, but it just seems to me that's the parallel argument to the argument Stephanie has given. And that's because this distinction between intending and letting it happen isn't a very good argument. I would be interested, actually, in considering what, what Stephanie would think if it were possible for there to be an artificial womb, so that no woman would have to have an abortion. Uh, any woman who didn't want to be pregnant could simply transfer it to the artificial womb and have it do its bit, and the infant would emerge. That, I just would be interested in hearing what she has to say. Um, <laughs> a related question is, Stephanie argues for the right to life. Now, the problem with the right to life is it's, it's, it's not really clear what it means. Rights are things, I said I don't really like rights, I don't think they're the right moral language to talk about abortion, so I was trying to shift it. That's why I didn't talk a lot about rights. Uh, I want, because rights are things that you hold against others, that you can demand of them as your due. That's what a right is. So I have a right to my pen, and if someone takes it from me, I can go and say, that's my pen, I can get it back. And indeed, there's a system, a legal system, where I can have that person arrested and forced to give it back to me, and they'll have to pay for violating my rights. That's the way rights talks work. So what about a right to life? Well, does that mean I get anything that I need to live? I have a right against anybody for anything that I need to live? So I might not have any food? Can I just take your food? Well, no, because it's yours. Just because you have a right to something doesn't mean you can force others to give you that thing. One of the things that's central to rights talk, going back to the very beginning of the tradition where rights were first introduced in our moral vocabulary, is that you have a right to control your body, you have a right to what happens to it. So does the fetus have a right against the woman to the use of her body? Now I think that's peculiar talk, I actually don't think it makes much sense. Rights are things that you exchange by means of contracts, you write contracts with one another, where I say, okay, you can use my pen for an hour. This is actually a very nice pen. My sister gave it to me for my graduation, uh, my PhD. Um, so I've had it for a while, and I don't really want to give it away, but I would lend it to you for, say, you know, 50 bucks. So we have an agreement, and we trade it, and if you break that agreement, well, then I can sue you. That's the way rights work. So what would be to say that the fetus has a right to life so that it can use the mother's womb, even if she doesn't want it there? It's a kind of a peculiar notion, because it makes it sound as if the fetus and the mother are writing a contract, where it's like, okay, I'm signing the lease, I'm moving in, nine months in your, in your womb. But no, that, that's, it's crazy talk, right? That's not the way it works. That's why I wanted to emphasize the complexity of human reproduction and the complexity of our moral understanding of human life, where we start as a fertilized egg and we end as an infant, those of us who actually get there. Stephanie started her, 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 um, her uh, remarks today by talking about celebrating being. Now the easy, the easy, the relatively easy case, the sort of the thin end of the wedge defending abortion is morally appropriate in some cases is the case where the, 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 the life of the mother is threatened. The harder cases are ones where 
the mother's life isn't threatened, or her health isn't threatened, and so on. But the idea of celebrating being, do we want to celebrate being in pain? Do we want to celebrate suffering? Think about the kinds of uh, cases where genetic testings have revealed that the fetus, if allowed to continue development to become an infant, will, ha will have a life that lasts maybe two weeks entirely filled with suffering. It might be a noble thing to do for the woman to carry that and to care for that infant for two weeks while it suffers and dies. That might be, but it strikes me it might also be a way of respecting that infant, respecting that life, respecting life itself by recognizing that that life should never happen, and they say by having an abortion. Now those are the more difficult cases. As I said, I don't need to defend any particular case of abortion, because I actually think it's really, a lot's going to depend on the circumstances. All I need to say is that there's one case where abortion is justified, and I've, I've, uh, I've, uh, re I've refuted my opponent, so I will stop there. So I can sense a little bit of this, I can sense a little bit of the tension gathering in the room. I would once again ask that everyone just wait. We will have questions very shortly, I promise you. And so without further ado, I'd like to call upon the first five minute closing statement. Uh, here. Ainsley calls into question this right to life, but that is a central part of any free society, any democratic society, is even our own charter talks about the right to life, and one needs the right to life in order to exercise any other right. It is the most fundamental of, of rights, and we as a society do have consequences for people who take away someone's right to life, as we do for someone who takes away Dr. Ainsley's pen. That's why murderers go to jail. And when we question them uh, in trial, we don't question how much their, um, their victims were developed or whether their victims or not were people. We know if they killed humans, they killed someone, and if we can prove that they did the killing, uh, then they go to jail. Now, he talks about, you know, if you're hungry, you don't have a right to steal food. But parents have a special responsibility to their offspring that they don't have to stranger. To strangers and what we're talking about with pregnancy and abortion is a parent-child relationship and so the child does have the right to have his or her basic needs met as a born child does and if a parent deprives a born child of food clothing or shelter uh, those basic needs to survive the parents will be up for parental neglect why isn't that also the case with pregnancy a woman uh, you know may have a right to do some things with her body but not just anything you know my right to swing my arms stops when I hit you in the nose. So I can't use my body to hurt someone else's body. It's also important to point out that every month a woman's body is getting ready for someone else's body. My body, in terms of my uterus, was designed for my offspring. It's a part of me that exists more for them than exists for me. Also, in terms of him saying he's not going to be precise about where he'd draw the line, I'd say if we're talking about human beings, you've got to err on the side of caution. If you don't know, you don't blow the building up if someone could potentially be inside. So we err on the side of caution. But we don't even need to say we don't know because I've provided the evidence for how the pre-born are human beings. He says, well, let's use the term fetus generically. Well, actually, I think it's an important point to realize the fetus is an age-based classification from the point of the end of nine weeks to birth, embryos from fertilization to nine weeks. These are age-based classifications, like infancy is a newborn, toddlers around the age of two, preteens until about 12, teenagers from 13 to 19. These are labels that we give to ages, but the whole time, the individual is a human. All of us can claim having once been 13, three, an infant, a fetus, and an embryo. None of us can claim ever having once been a sperm or an egg. So if it would have been wrong to kill us when we were three, it would also be wrong to kill us when we're a fetus and when we're an embryo. Now he talked about saying that be, because I talked about permitting a salpingectomy that I've given an exception to my case. No, I haven't, and here's proof of that. 
You can do something besides a salpingectomy for a case of an ectopic pregnancy. You can give a woman methotrexate. Methotrexate is a drug that targets rapidly dividing cells. There is some question that methotrexate targets the trophoblast, which is the pre-placenta of the baby, a necessary organ, in some sense necessary, although external to the baby's body, necessary like the heart. I've written a whole paper as to why methotrexate is not an ethical solution to ectopic pregnancy, because you're saving the mother by way of directly killing the child. So it is possible to intervene in a way that isn't an abortion, which is what a salpingectomy is. Now, in terms of him saying, well, celebrate being, what about being in pain? When people are in pain, shouldn't we kill pain, not people? Shouldn't we alleviate suffering, not eliminate sufferers? That's why we have hospitals and not killing centers. A couple years ago, I was comparing the Rwandan genocide to abortion, and a woman from Rwanda walked past. And I asked her how she felt about the two graphic images I had side by side of children in Rwanda and pre-born children aborted. I suddenly became concerned that she would be offended by me comparing these two things because she told me most of her family had been killed in the genocide. After I asked her how she felt, she looked at the two images in silence. And after about 20 seconds, she pointed to the picture of the aborted baby. And she said, that's worse because at least my family could try to run away. I would say abortion is ultimately about power. We do it because we can. Human rights violations in history are always about power. If 50% of the time the pre-born child could fight back and the abortionist would be killed by her, do you think he'd do it? I don't think he'd take the risk. Should we pick on people because they're weaker? Or should we say your weakness, it doesn't absolve me of responsibility. It heightens my responsibility. Thank you. Final five minute closing statement of this invigorating debate. I'd like to call upon uh, the last of it. Thank you. All right. Um, start with the question of pain and power. So I'll tell you how I got interested in bioethics. I got interested in bioethics when I worked in a housing program for people with HIV and AIDS. Uh, and in particular, when I was helping someone die. And dying is not a very pleasant process. It involves a lot of pain and suffering as you stop breathing. And in the course of that, I started reading and thinking about assisted dying, about whether it's ever OK to help someone die. Now obviously the difference between an adult who is confident and making decisions about his desire to die rather than to suffer anymore uh, is different from the case of the death of a fetus. I do want to say that being in pain isn't something that should be reserved at all costs and that someone who thinks that a fetus that is developing into an infant who will live for two weeks of utter pain is doing something humane, I disagree with that. I don't think such a life should have to be lived. I think it's an inhumane thing to do. I don't think that's an exercise of power. I think that's an exercise of respect for human life. Because I ultimately think the abortion debate is how we should respect human life. Do we respect women's lives? And do we respect children's lives, infants' lives, and the lives of, and indeed I think there is something there to be respected, a fetus, even from the moment of conception. I've argued repeatedly that from the moment of conception there is something morally significant at stake. There's that irreplaceable individual that will never be again. 
But I think that that's not sufficient to say that the death of that is the same as the death for you of me. And again, I'll show, just remind you, that's only 40% of those that even get to the stage of being an embryo. So Stephanie was reminding us that these, 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 these labels make a difference, and in fact, it's a zygote at the beginning. It's not an embryo until there's implantation, which is something that hasn't really appeared in her discussion yet. I don't mean to deny that there's a right to life, that you and I have rights to life. I think rights are judicial entities. I think rights only make sense in a legal context. A right to life is a right against others. Remember, rights have this transactional feature. It's a right against others that they not cause your death unjustly. We all have that. I don't think a fertilized egg has that. I think a fertilized egg is an irreplaceable human creature that, that if it doesn't come to term, is a loss. It's not a loss that's sufficient to overcome the kind of distortion it might have on the life of a woman if it were caused her death. And I will stop there. So we're about to enter the part of the debate I'm sure you've all been waiting for, which will be the questions and answer period. So the way that I'm gonna have this work, just to start off, is all those who will be asking questions specifically to, to uh, Stephanie will be on this side, and all those who will be asking questions specifically to Donald will be on this side. If you have a question for both debaters, feel free to line up on whichever side of the room is closer to you. So uh, a couple of things that I jotted down while listening to the debate that I would encourage you to listen to or ignore as you please were uh, some interesting questions. And in debate, we offer, uh, often summarize these sort of ideas and interesting questions. So the first question that I had for the audience, audience is, is there ever a point of moral rel relativity which would make abortion acceptable considering the topic? The second point, which didn't come out really until the end in the closing topics, which I think would be a, a more interesting uh, arbiter of dis discussion, was this idea of how do we respect human life best and which side does so? Because both sides basically made a claim to be respecting human life more in and of themselves. So I'll leave, that, leave it to that. I will also remind those who are asking questions that if you are asking questions, I will give precedence to those who have not asked questions. I don't really want a Ferris wheel of question ask askers. So just keep that in mind. I will start on this side of the room. Is there a line or is that? OK. Hi, Stephanie. I want to ask you something about the, the film that you show us today. I, I want to know if you agree with me that the abortion, that abortion that we saw is not a second rate. You know? I will explain short my point. When a woman is raped by drugs for fellows in a party, they were asleep, right? They didn't fail even the, the rape. They wake up and they find I'm raped, right? And for a moral imperative, and it's toxic, and no are the same time and the same kind of drugs, and that image is worse than a rape. I feel inside something really that something is wrong with the moral imperative that our other panelists show us, but for me it's a second rate. Do you agree? The way I, I've described uh, abortion on rape victims is that it is like a medical rape, in that just as a rape uh, it vilely enters her body, uh, the rapist violently enters her body in an act without her consent. Um, the abortion, abortionists and the abortion instruments enter her body in a way, and end pregnancy in a way it wasn't designed to be ended and to be done. Um, birth is the natural end termination of, of pregnancy. Uh, in terms of comparing suffering, uh, I, I you know, know of the guy I mentioned without arms and legs, and he often says, well, we shouldn't compare other people's suffering. So to say, you know, rape is worse than abortion, or abortion is worse than rape, what I prefer to just say is both of those are horrific evils. Both involve harming the innocent. 
And you make a good point in terms of if rohypnol or some drug is given to the rape victim so that she doesn't know she's being raped because she's knocked out, it's still wrong. The immorality of the action comes down to the innocent human being being violated, not the cognitive awareness of the innocent human being at the time of violation. So whether the preborn are aware or not aware of what's being done to them, I would say uh, it, is, it is wrong and it is indeed uh, a violation of a life. Call on a question. Do I, do I get a, yeah, you, you get one as well. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to say we just weren't given enough information to know what to make of that image. Uh, you know, it could be worse than a rape. Uh, it could be the case of a pregnant woman with a wanted pregnancy being forced to have her uh, fetus removed from her. I think that would be a terrible, horrible thing to to do, as bad or worse than a rape. Uh, it could be something that, say, a woman who was raped, who is um, deeply self-destructive and is going to kill herself if she doesn't get rid of this fetus that was forced onto her, in which case I don't think that's worse than a rape. I think that might actually be a liberation. So this side there. So my question is um, kind of based on a couple, but I think what you said was um, abortion and the life debate is a personal issue. You think it's so complex that we need to agree to disagree, and it's relative depending on the situation. So then, my question is, if it's so relative, why are you here? Why should I listen to you? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> they invited me. <laughs> to say something's relative to a situation doesn't mean that anything goes. Uh, it means that we have to take into account all the complexities before we make a judgment. And that's all I'm saying. I'm saying that. So that there's a relativity of the situation where we have to think about what's at stake. I also think that reasonable people, when it comes to a complex matter of morality, can disagree with one another. So you know, some of you might be religious, some of you might not. Those are reasonable differences in a state like ours. We tolerate different religions because we respect that on these deep, challenging moral questions, the state shouldn't be in a position of enforcing one particular conception of morality, say Catholicism or Judaism or whatever. So also, I think, particularly in the early stages uh, of uh, pregnancy, the, the issues that are at stake are intimate questions about the deep questions about what matters in life. So I don't think it's the state's position to tell us what to do. Each of us will have our own considered positions what to do, and we'll have deep thoughts about it. You know, Stephanie will think that any abortion is a deep moral wrong. And I, you know, I might, depending on the situation, I'd have to find out more. So I'm not saying, and one of us will be right and one of us will be wrong on that particular question. I'm not a relativist at all. But I do think morality is complex, and it's something like the beginning of human life is a terribly complex issue, and it's not available for some simple resolution. Notice everything Dr. Ainsley is saying just wouldn't work if we were talking about rape or infanticide or the Holocaust or slavery. We don't say, well, these are complex situations. Maybe sometimes these are acceptable. We always say they're never acceptable because innocent human beings' uh, lives are being taken from them or their basic right not to be enslaved, for example, is being taken from them. So why then wouldn't we also have that same attitude towards the pre-born? When he says, let's agree to disagree, I would say that when you are dealing with a moral issue of this magnitude, that's a very problematic attitude to have. Instead, I would say, let's agree that we disagree. Let's agree that our disagreement is a problem. Let's agree that if I'm wrong, I'm taking away perhaps a woman's right or I'm controlling a woman's life. Let's agree that if he's wrong and I'm right, that he's enabling and allowing innocent human beings to be killed. So let's agree that we're both or all going to think more deeply about this issue. Let's agree we're going to look for the truth. And as I believe it was Tolstoy who once said, truth like gold is to be discovered by removing from it all that is not gold. Okay. This side of the room, go ahead. Uh, my question is, um, in your presentation you were talking about how you condemn the act but not the person. Um, and I'm actually, like, I, I'm wondering why that is because you said in the presentation you said um, that, that we, you know, because we all make mistakes and, and you know, that's that. And you don't think, you, you mentioned a couple of your friends having abortions and, you know, we all make mistakes so that's fine. Um, if, 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 in fact, all abortion is killing, regardless of when it's actually done, um, shouldn't shouldn't the, um, you know killing is so I, I'm assuming you, you think it's murder so if you do 
then shouldn't the shouldn't the murderer be responsible? And if not, because if you don't think your we your friends shouldn't be resp uh, held responsible for that, why why do you? So it seems that you think it's different. Killing you know killing fetuses is different from killing you know like a five year old or something like that. So I sense that there's a difference in your, even though you didn't explicitly address it, but I sense that there's a difference in your attitude towards both. And I'm just wondering if you have more to say about that. Great question. In terms of uh, treating those who commit abortions differently from those who, let's say, commit other things, once abortion is illegal and women who have them are breaking a law, I'm consistent. I believe the consequences for women who break that law should be the same as consequences for women who break the law and kill their born children. <coughs> But currently, there is no law that women are breaking. And not only are they not breaking the law, there's the practical issue of almost every woman would then go to jail. So I, once it is against the law, then, then I will be, you know, say, yes, we have to do this or that. But even in saying that there have to be consequences for the person who commits the injustice, what the point I was trying to get across in terms of saying I don't condemn them, in that I'm, I'm not saying you're a horrible person. I think what the person did was a horrible thing. But my experience of having interacted with many post-abortive women is that they are um, uh, the ones I've interacted with are often very uh, upset about what they've done. They feel horrible about what they've done, and I want them to know that there is healing that's available. That was sort of the point of my my statement. Is and even in historical atrocities, uh, people who have committed great injustices have found forgiveness and healing. A case in point is Corey Ten Boom, is a woman who hid Jews in her home during the Holocaust. She was eventually arrested. Her and her sister were taken to a concentration camp. Her sister died. She survived. And one day after the war, she was giving a talk, and she was speaking about forgiveness. And after her talk, a man walked up to her and said, I used to work at one of the camps. I would like to ask you, will you forgive me? And suddenly, everything came back into her memory. She found out he worked at the camp that she was a prisoner at. And she thought, I don't want to forgive this man. And then she just realized forgiveness is not a feeling, it is a choice. And she stuck out her hand and she said, I forgive you. And the feeling of forgiveness followed after the choice to forgive him. I'm not sure I get that, because I, I, I kind of think that if there's a Holocaust going on right now, all of us should be in, in, in uh, the opposition. All of us should be out there fighting and stopping it. Now, <laughs> the, the, yeah, <laughs> For the sake of expediency, um, we only have about 21 minutes for questions, so I'd ask that both questioners, uh, the, the debaters, and uh, like take as uh, little time as they can with their questions and answers, and also for expediency, the clapping would be great to like hold off until the end. <laughs> <laughs> this side of the room, go ahead. I, I was just trying to figure out the structure of your argument to try to say that um, there are situations where abortion can be okay. Mm -hmm. And from the best that I could figure out is that you're saying that there are situations where we don't respond rationally to someone if they have a miscarriage. And since we don't respond rationally, um, if they are indeed as human as a two-year-old, two that we don't respond in the same way, that that for some reason makes it a moral, accept, morally acceptable thing. It's kind of like our opinions and how we take a situation make something moral. Is that fair or? Uh, no, not really. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, I, what I was trying to, there's always a question. So how do we argue when it comes to morality? Uh, you suggested you know, one way is to you know, come up with some, you know, some fast and hard things. So from the moment of conception onward, and then of course, all of our practices are massively inconsistent. So you could just say society is irrational. That's, that's what Stephanie has suggested, and I think that's what you're suggesting. I'm arguing in a slightly different way. I'm saying morality is a complex social structure, and uh, if we, there are different ways of investigating it. One way of investigating it is through rational argumentation. Another way of investigating it is, is observing how it functions in our lives. So I was making a functional argument about the role of and the way the understanding of morality that's common in our lives. So I'm saying, you know, those those six percent of fetuses that never make it to a pregnancy that the woman never even knows about it, we don't we don't take those to be morally serious. Now you could say we're just irrational. We should all be burying our menstrual pads every 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 month if you're sexually active, um, because you know any birth control you might have used might not be working. Um, you could take that line. You know that at least is consistent. I'm trying to suggest, well, maybe what we can do instead is think back from our moral responses to those kinds of cases and understand what's at stake morally differently. So then I offered a rational reconstruction of our moral practices in light of a different understanding of what's at stake at the beginning of life. 
The fact that someone may not bury a dead body doesn't mean it's okay for them to kill a living body. So that's what this really comes down to is, is the act of abortion killing someone, if we have inconsistencies in other areas of our life in terms of how we treat those people, doesn't make it okay to actually kill these innocent human beings. If you think about someone randomly coming in and shooting three of us and die, and we die, and ask, and if we were to ask ourselves, why would that be wrong? Is it because we're educated? Because we happen to be in Toronto? Is it wrong because we're male or female? Or is it wrong because we're innocent human beings whose lives were unjustly taken from them? That's why the courts would put our killer in jail. So if that's why it's wrong to kill us, then at whatever point that we've existed, it would be wrong to kill us. And again, we exist existed at an infancy, fetalhood, and, and in the embryonic period. Of course, the courts deny that we have such a right, so. <laughs> All right, I'll take a question from this side of the room now. Hi. Um, I just have a question about the, uh, the, the diagram, uh, the spectrum of life that you, that you showed. Uh, I certainly agree that life is a spectrum in the four areas that you listed, but just because there is a spectrum, I mean, why does it mean that we have to treat each stage uh, the same review with the same. We certainly don't look at, uh, say, a 12-year-old child the same as someone who's at the end of life on ventilator support. You know, um, I think, and I, I would say that when you go back to your early life, it becomes a grayer and grayer issue. You can say that the pro-choice group draws this arbitrary line, but I don't think it is an arbitrary line. We, we base those decisions based on how we're raised, our religious beliefs, uh, our personal experiences, the same way that pro, uh, pro-life people do. I mean, and, and that's what makes it all so complicated, you know? I mean, I, I just a personal, I know this is getting long, but I think <laughs> it would be good if the pro-choice and pro-life side kind of come together and maybe try to define times when maybe we do have an agreement that this is really right or this is wrong, rather than just, you know, go our, uh, try, to, try to fight our own side. Okay, thank you for your question. In terms of different different stages, sometimes we treat differently. Yes, we do. I mean, when you're five, you don't have the right to vote. So there are some rights or privileges that we get by virtue of abilities. But I haven't heard anyone call into question the basic right to life. It sort of seems self-evident that it's wrong to directly and intentionally kill innocent human beings. Even if at the end of someone's life, Let's say uh, we don't do extraordinary measures, we only do ordinary measures. So maybe there's some medical procedures that will be excessively burdensome and they have no hope of benefit. Withholding or, or withdrawing those burdensome, no benefit types of procedures isn't the same as directly killing someone. Surely we can all agree that we shouldn't directly and intentionally kill innocent human beings. So that's why it keeps coming down to that. And that's why I would say the most illogical position is a position in the middle. And I remember when I was at UBC, I took a bioethics course and my prof basically said, it's either a human and it's always wrong to kill it, like it's always wrong to kill you and me, or it's not a human and why would we ever say it's wrong to do the act which doesn't kill the human. So to try to find middle ground is the most illogical position to hold and is filled with holes. So it's either all right or all wrong. I take myself to be an innocent human being, um, and I do hope at some point someone will directly and intentionally kill me, uh, namely when they do it at my bidding at the end of my life. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you, Okay. Go ahead. Um, Dr. Ainsley, I, I know you didn't, like in, in your initial speech, you said you didn't really want to consider the legal questions as much because you think that it's it's more of a, a personal moral question, but it was just um, from what, something that Stephanie said, I mean, the law does have to legislate certain issues of morality, like rape or murder or whatever, those, those are questions of morality, so I guess, I guess what I'm wondering is that the law has to decide in some way who it's going to protect, and I'm wondering how do you how do you see the law as decide, drawing a line and saying which human beings are to be protected and which aren't? Because the the law the law can't be based on an emotional response or personal human morals. It has it, it has to work out in some rational way. 
So I'm just wondering what you would say to that. Uh, the law, it's, it's a, a complicated question in relation between law and morality. Um, we want uh, justice, which is the, the primary virtue of the legal system, <laughs> is a moral dimension. Uh, so we want a just legal system. A just legal system will be tolerant of people with deep moral disagreements when those disagreements are reasonable. So a law hinges on when there's a reasonable disagreement. Uh, so that's, that's the challenge. Now, how does the law actually do that? Well, the concern about the law is that the law gets implemented by having nine people in Ottawa make rulings. And why do they get to do that? Well, they're appointed by the prime minister. The concern is that they're going to use their power simply to force all of us to live by their moral codes. Uh, and so in an attempt to avoid that, the law in our Anglo tradition uh, draws on a series of precedents as to how previous decisions have been made. So when they think about what everyone in the charter means, so everyone in section seven has the right to life, liberty, security of the person, uh, and the right not to have that infringed upon itself in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. Um, you look at the legal decisions around abortion, they say, most of the time they say, we're not gonna decide that issue because it's too much for the law to figure out. We're not gonna decide if life begins at conception or not. We don't have to because there are other reasons, namely respect for liberty that require us to, in the case of the Morgenthal decision, overturn the particular abortion law that was in place in Canada at the time, because that law arbitrarily had little groups of doctors deciding whether or not women got to have abortions. Uh, so at the moment, we have no abortion law in Canada. It's, there is no law, which is kind of bizarre. I think there should be myself, because I think, you know, I think an abortion at eight and a half months, unless there is something really, really, really serious going on, is something that should be illegal. I would say we restrict liberties when liberties hurt lives. That's why we have laws against drinking and driving, because your freedom to drink and drive could result in uh, ending someone's life. So the law gets involved when choices are made that seriously hurt, if not end the life uh, of another. And in terms of just the earlier remark you made, because this is my 30 seconds to make my point, um, <laughs> In him saying, you know, at the end of his life, as an innocent person, he wants someone to end his life. Whether I agree with him or disagree with him on that, I bet you anything we both agree that if he doesn't ask for his life to be ended and someone else chooses to end his life, that that wouldn't be appropriate. In other words, even if someone says, <laughs> even if someone says, I want you to kill me, an infant can't tell me that I can't go kill the infant. I err on the side of caution. Thank you. So I'm just going to be very honest with all of you who are standing here waiting. <laughs> there is only going to be realistically, and this is being extremely optimistic, three from each side that get to ask questions. So if you are more than the third person, I like, just for your sake, it would probably be better to sit, sit down. You can stand up as you like. I can't force you to sit down. <laughs> realistically, we're only going to have three from each side. But without further ado, I'll call upon you again. All right. Hi. Um, you showed some pretty emotionally potent pictures in your presentation, you showed um, Jews suffering in the Holocaust, you showed a black man who was a slave, um, you showed indigenous peoples who were considered to be not, not persons, um, who were slaughtered, and you showed women who were not allowed to vote yet. Um, i just like to say that, I mean, I am a sinner, and, uh, it, uh, but I, I questioned your judgment in, in you um, comparing me to a Nazi, um, and it, it reminded me of a question that was asked by, like, I promise you, my favorite guy ever, and I'd like to ask it to you right now. Um, he asked, uh, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Um, it seemed to me that um, the comparison you drew was, a, was, was pretty crude at best, and it, uh, at least to me, um, uh, seemed like a bit of a log in your eye, uh, if I may. Uh, Sure, I actually appreciate the question and the opportunity to, to clarify. Uh, in, con in making parallels, I was paralleling victims and not victimizers. I'll be the first one to say that in making comparisons between abortion and the Holocaust, I don't think women are Nazis who have abortions. The parallel I'm making is that at the time the Holocaust occurred or these other injustices, the victims were deemed to be inferior to those other people in society. And as a result of being deemed inferior, society rationalized killing them. Which I also think shows something about our human nature. 
Our human nature is, in a sense, so good that we won't kill someone that's like us. The Nazis had to first tell themselves they're not like us, they're parasites. The Hutus in Rwanda had to first tell themselves the Tutsis aren't like us, they're cockroaches. So in some sense, they had that innate sense of if he's my equal, I cannot kill him. Only if he's my unequal, I can kill him. And so all I'm trying to point out is that the preborn have been denied the very personhood status that humans in other parts of history have been denied. Uh, in condemning the action, as I clearly said, I'm not judging the person, I'm judging the behavior. And if I say rape is wrong, am I guilty of not taking the law out of my own eye? No, but abortion's different for me. Nope, I, I, I apologize, but I do, <laughs> I do have to enforce that there won't be crosstalk. Okay, go ahead. I still don't think I get the consistency of the view here, because if, if every abortion is murder and the victims are like the victims of the Holocaust, then every abortion doctor is a vicious Nazi, a Mengele, um, <laughs> and it should be stopped. So I just really don't see the consistency of the view here. So, okay, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Angley. Thanks for being here. Uh, I have a, um, I, I'm really interested in your uh, understanding of morality, and I have to say I was surprised to hear you say that you are in no way a relativist. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, you can defend that, but I, I was surprised. Um, you based uh, your understanding of morality on intuition, largely, and I agree that this is very useful. Um, in helping determine what is moral and immoral. But what happens, I wonder, when intuition differs? Because Stephanie gave an example of a woman who instinctively wanted to bury her um, miscarriage. And there are many examples of people who feel nothing when they lose um, a child at that age, or a, a, a pre-born person. Uh, sorry, I don't know how to use a non-neutral language here, but <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, yes. Right, I'm not a relativist because I have opinions, so I give reasons for them. So, and then I could be wrong. I could be completely wrong. Stephanie thinks I'm wrong. Some of you, no doubt, think I'm wrong. Stephanie gives her views, and she gives reasons for them, and she might be wrong. I think she's wrong on lots of things. That means I'm not a relativist. If there's right or wrong in moral judgments, that's not relativism, that's objectivism. So what I was saying is that each of us, as individuals, does our best to sort out the complexity of morality. And I was offering you some phenomena that you can think about to help understand your own conception of morality better. You might come up with a conception of morality that differs from me. You might be wrong, I might be right, or vice versa. I can't, I'm not in the business of doing that. I'm in the business of providing new tools to think about morality, because that's what I do as a philosopher. I'm not in the business of coming in and, and, and saying, you know, this is the, the truth about morality, thus and so. That's not really what I'm interested in. Personally, some philosophers do that. It's not what I do. The legal question is different. We need to have a legal order where there's one rule that, that governs us all. And that's why I argue for tolerance in that regard. And so since we're both making claims and claiming what's right and claiming what's wrong, the question we all have to ask ourselves is, who does the better job providing reasons to back up their claims? Who's provided evidence? Who's refuted that evidence? Who's provided clarity? Who's provided consistency? Whose view is not arbitrary? Whose view is exclusive of certain humans versus inclusive of all humans? And whose view doesn't result in savage inequality? <laughs> See, I'm not going to get by on the clapping rule. I will call <laughs> now on this side of the room. Hi, my name is Kate D'Angelo, and I realize I'm, an, I'm, I'm a big minority in this room, I can tell right now. But uh, Stephanie, you were talking about very expensive procedures and drugs that could get around uh, not having to abort when a woman's life is in peril. Um, and I was just wondering what you thought about the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, being the rape capital of the world, 12-year-olds being raped and having for being forced to have their children. And when they are, when they do have those children, can't return to their villages, um, half the time they die um, trying to abort themselves. Um, Dr. Bill Borders and the World Health Organization has promoted abortions in these areas and started the Canadian government before Harvard came along. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, bias. Um, but I also wanted to point out that um, the 7% of the women that 
do choose to have their babies, the babies end up starving or the women end up killing themselves and then committing infanticide. So I was just wondering what you thought about that because you've drawn a very harsh line considering there are different not Canadian realities around the world. Certainly there are circumstances that are so difficult words can't describe how difficult they are. The difficult position I'm put in by your question is I look like a mean, horrible person to deprive someone what seems to be reasonable health care based on the circumstances they're in. And I am a mean, horrible person depriving them of reasonable health care if the preborn aren't human and if abortion doesn't kill those humans. But as long as the evidence stands that abortion is an action which directly and intentionally kills innocent human beings, then what you're asking me is when born human beings are in unimaginably, indescribably difficult circumstances, is it ethical to kill other innocent, vulnerable human beings for the circumstances their parents are in? That's what you're asking me. You and I can both agree that that's a crisis, and I can agree there's a solution to that crisis, but the solution isn't abortion. The solution isn't to commit another injustice in the midst of an injustice. So there's a problem going on, and we need a solution to it, but providing 12-year-old girls the trauma of abortion, the invasiveness of abortion, is not going to erase the trauma of the rape, it's just going to create another victim. We need solutions, but killing isn't the solution. On my view, um, I think, as I've said, and I think perhaps surprising Stephanie a little bit, is that there is something distinctive that's at stake every time uh, a fertilized egg fails to yield a human being. We've lost something irreplaceable. I just think sometimes there are things that are need to be done even if that must eventuate. And I think this is exactly one of these cases. These women are in tragic circumstances and are forced into a situation where they can't have children uh, in this situation, and I think that's tragic. I don't think the abortion is wrong. I think it's the right thing to do in the situation. Okay, this side of the room, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Ansley. I have three questions for you. Three? Uh, so, uh, I'll be quick. Uh, is there such a thing as natural law? Um, is the entity of fertilization possessing human nature? And in the dilemma of when the life of a mother is at risk and the, she's carrying a child, is that the same as abortion? Since that was much quicker than everything else, I'll... <laughs> <laughs> there's, there are natural laws, like the, the law of gravity and the laws of relativity, and I don't think there's a moral natural law. I don't think you can read off morality from nature. Is there given nature? Yes. And um, when the life of a mother is at risk, yes, that's abortion, but abortion to save the life of the mother and can be justified. Three questions was the quickest one. All right, go ahead. <laughs> um, yes, Saki, um, it was a good presentation. I, I enjoyed your anecdotes. Some of them were very poetic and some not so poetic. But um, I think um, there's, 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 there's maybe you know, clarity missing here. And then I think a lot of things are getting confused as a difference. Um, Dr. Ainsley said numerous times there's a difference between a right plane and a moral plane. Um, but I feel like they're being talked in a sort of same tone that's maybe not useful. Here's an example. You refer to the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. The, the tenets of that declaration are not philosophically, morally universal claims. They are right claims that come with qualification. For instance, right to life is only, you only have a right to life if you, know, you don't go around killing anyone you want. Certain situations like that. So, um, I feel that in a situation like this, to make a categorical philosophical claim is, I think, what you're doing by saying that something is wrong. We're not saying you know something is bad, evil. You're making a categorical claim, and 100% that it's wrong. Um, Hume famously said that any claim needs to be proportionate to its evidence. I feel if you're going to make a categorical, absolute 100% claim, you need 100% um, evidence besides maybe anecdotes. Okay, well, I've provided evidence for the humanity of the pre-born. Now, perhaps you're not questioning my second claim in those three sentences I had at the beginning. Perhaps you're questioning my first claim, which is that it is wrong to directly and intentionally kill innocent human beings. If you want to call into question that claim, 
I don't know if I have anything to say to you. Now, I'd also like to point out that I use my wording very carefully. I use the term innocent because I recognize there are some people who will support the death penalty because of guilty criminals, or they will support war because of human rights violations in certain countries, or they'll support self-defense, which may involve killing someone. But in all of those cases, you're acting against an aggressor. Even if we agree or disagree on how we treat guilty people, we should be able to agree on how we treat innocent people. And the, that's why that first premise stands, which is that it's wrong to directly and intentionally kill innocent, keyword being innocent, so, human beings. I understand. I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm not picking and choosing. Come afterwards, I'll talk to you. <laughs> I'm not picking and choosing, but I can't allow cross or else we just won't be able to get some more but questions. I, I think so, I'm I'm really sorry. I will point out that I have rejected the, 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 the claim that it's always wrong to directly kill innocent human beings uh, as well. Um, I particularly focused on the end of life and voluntary killing, and, and Stephanie came back and said, what about involuntary killing? I actually think there are involuntary killings that can be justified as well um, at the end of life uh, and at the beginning of life. So I, I think her claim that that's an, un a, a, an uncontroversial premise is too simple. All right, just to be clear, I'm not, I'm not trying to cut people off, but it's like, as the moderator, I can't allow crosstalk. I apologize. All right, <laughs> go ahead. Um, a lot of your talk is framed around women's rights and uh, the women's rights of her own body and avoiding harm and so on. Just wanted to bring in Norma McCorvey. I'm not sure if you've heard of her. Um, you probably know her by Jane Roe. And Jane Roe was the woman who originally brought um, abortion into the States, Roe versus Wade. And she's actually come over to the pro-life then. And uh, she's, she's um, at one point in time filed a that a try like a, an attempt to reverse her case on the grounds that it actually harms women. Um, and backing up would be harms them physically. Often they can't have children after. Um, and secondly, and perhaps more life impactingly, um, it harms them in terms of their mental, um, yeah, their psychological impact. A tremendous uh, post-abortion trauma. Um, how would you answer that? <laughs> uh, I actually, I, was, I didn't mean to particularly be arguing from women's rights or women's rights to control their bodies. I was trying not to particularly make a rights argument because I think those are primarily legal arguments and I was interested more in the moral question. But I'll take your question at face value. Um, you know, my, my bottom line is that if in her considered moral view now, she's changed her mind, she doesn't want to have an abortion, she shouldn't have one. Um, and in a tolerant society, when it comes to these deep, challenging questions of personal morality, we let people live by their own conception of what's right or wrong. So I think the, the law in the United States is right not to have overturned Roe v. Wade just because she changed her mind. This isn't a relativist view, I'll say. You know, she might have changed her mind from a falsehood to the truth. She might have changed her mind from the truth to a falsehood. I don't know. You know I do my best of thinking about it for myself. Um, she doesn't have an, she doesn't want to have an abortion. She shouldn't have one. If you don't want to own a slave, just don't own one. If you don't want to rape a woman, just don't rape one. But it's okay if other people commit rape or if other people commit slavery. Of course not. We would never say those two claims. I said them. I don't mean them. It was done to make a point. <laughs> but my point simply is. If the pre-born human and abortion kills them, it keeps coming back to abortion is parallel to those other issues if it harms innocent human beings like those other issues. It's not parallel if it doesn't. So that's why that's the issue that has to be addressed. And just in terms of Norma McCorvey, as well as Dr. Bernard Nathanson, who co-founded NARAL, which made abortion legal in the US, Dr. Tony Lovatino, three names of people who are, were major leaders in the abortion rights movement who became pro-life. I know of no major leader in the pro-life movement who has gone to support abortion. So I'll take the question from this side. I can only take this one last question. Uh, Dr. Ainsley, you made a moral argument that um, emotional attachment is key to how we view a moral argument. So I'd like to take that emotional attachment that you put on a woman to her um, embryo in the first few weeks of life when chances are it may not implant or it may um, just spontaneously abort to my aunt, whom I may not know because she lives across the world. If she gets mur murdered 
because I am not emotionally attached to her, because I never knew her, does that make that murder less wrong, or is that uh, no impact? No, no, of course not. And, and I just want to be clear about the role of, of, of emotions in my argument. I'm not saying because we have an emotional argument to this particular fact that that's what makes that fact wrong. That's, you know, uh, this gentleman over here invoked David Hume, who's my favorite philosopher. Uh, <laughs> some people read Hume that way, that's a bad reading of Hume as well. Um, rather, my point was that morality is a complex social structure. We have to try to understand its operations. And one way to understand it is to look at our intuitions about a series of phenomena that we know happen. something that actually uh, has never properly been addressed by Stephanie, which is the fact that all of these, you know, she has this arrow going from fertilization to a 20-year-old, so a lot of stopping points in those very first few days and weeks. Uh, when we start thinking about that, we start thinking about what that says about the, the moral status. How, you, know, you could just simply say we're irrational in the way we treat menstruation. You could say that. I just want you to think about how much that would change our understanding of what it is to be a human, what it is to have a human body like ours. Stephanie likes to make her arguments from human nature. I think she and I understand human nature differently. I'm not opposed to it as such, but think about our human nature as reproducing beings, sexual beings, women, the women of our beings who menstruate, and so on. And I think it would be a very, very, very different world if the moral status of the fetus at the moment of conception were the same as an infant at the moment of birth. It would be a very different world, and that's why I think we're talking about something and we're not being honest. We're debating about what's moral, but here's what I really think we're debating about. What's easy? We're talking about what's right or wrong, but what we really mean is what's easy versus hard. The questions I've been asked are about what's easy versus hard. And what makes my position so difficult is the conclusion I'm coming to is not please be against abortion because it's the easy thing to do. My evidence and information tonight is please be against abortion because it's the right thing to do. And guess what? Often in life, doing what's right is not easy. That's the end of my job. I'll now call upon Lucy to end things off. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, I'd, oh, I'd just like to take this opportunity um, to make thank yous. Um, thank you so much to our debaters. This was such a hot voting. behind the scenes people that made this event possible, the alumni and various members of our club who've been working really hard and running around and doing things and for NCLN, our co-sponsor. So thank you all guys for today. <laughs> so there's food inside. If you all want to gather after and hopefully discuss more, we also have a club email list. If you if you're interested in this kind of thing and you want to sign up, please feel free to do so. And yes.